Welcome to another edition of Come Follow Me, Doctrine and Covenants, section 93. In this, we'll read that the glory of God is intelligence, and I have more to say about that a little later on. I'd like to start with verse 19 to give us a premise of why it is so important that we study the truths taught in section 93. Verse 19 makes the observation that I, I give unto you these sayings, the things I've given you in the first 18 verses and the things I'm giving you in the, the, the other 40 verses. I give unto you these sayings that you may understand and know how to worship and know what you worship that you may come unto the Father in my name and in due time receive his fullness. We need to understand what we are worshiping and how we are worshiping. So keep that in the back of your mind as we look at some of the early truths in section 93. How to worship and what to worship. Joseph Smith taught that if men do not comprehend the character of God, they do not comprehend themselves. Can you see why? In order to understand what and how to worship, we've got to understand God and the Savior Jesus Christ and who they are and what they believe and what they teach and what they stand for so that we can know how to worship them and what we are worshiping when we worship them. If we don't comprehend the character of God, we don't comprehend ourselves. Truth number one, if you are willing to forsake your sins, and come to Christ and obey his voice by keeping his commandments, they shall see my face and know that I am. Just like Moses, just like Lehi, just like Joseph Smith, just like the brother of Jared, just like John the Revelator, <laughs> and prophets throughout the ages have beheld the face of the Lord we too, by forsaking our sins, calling upon his name, keeping his commandments, that is a promise. My favorite verse from the Book of Mormon comes from Second Nephi 9. The keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. If we are faithful and true to our covenants and commandments and continually repent of our sins, we will behold the face of Jesus Christ in a coming day. Truth number two, Jesus reminds us, I am the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. You know the song, the Lord is my light, the Lord is my strength, by day and by night I'll conquer at length. I love the hymns, sorry for singing right there, but I love that the Lord is our light. Truly, we're going to have dark days dark weeks, dark months, dark years in our life when we turn away from the Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ brings light and enlightenment and joy and wisdom. Jesus Christ is light, and we've got to do everything in our life to bring more light into our life. I wonder if a lot of the discouragement, the overwhelming feelings of of anxiety and depression. I wonder if a lot of those things that seem to be growing so much in the world are somehow connected to our disconnecting from the light of the world, Jesus Christ. All I know is that if we will hold true and fast to the light of the Savior, Jesus Christ, it will be easier to have more light and joy in our life. I'm so grateful for the Savior and his inviting us to invite him, light, into our life. Here's another truth, number three. I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and the Father and I are one. I'm going to play the quote from Elder Holland, that they are one in every significant and eternal aspect, except being the same person. There is one thing we would not like anyone to wonder about. That is whether or not we are Christians. By and large, any controversy in this matter has swirled around two doctrinal issues, our view of the Godhead and our belief in the principle of continuing revelation, leading to an open scriptural canon. In addressing this, we do not need to be apologists for our faith, but we would like not to be misunderstood. So with a desire to increase understanding 
and unequivocally declare our Christianity, I speak today on the first of those two doctrinal issues just mentioned. Our first and foremost article of faith in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is, We believe in God the Eternal Father and in His Son Jesus Christ and in the Holy Ghost. We believe these three divine persons constituting a single Godhead are united in purpose, in manner, in testimony, in mission. We believe them to be filled with the same godly sense of mercy and love, justice and grace, patience, forgiveness, and redemption. I think it's accurate to say we believe they are one in every significant and eternal aspect imaginable except believing them to be three persons combined in one substance, a Trinitarian notion never set forth in the scriptures because it is not true. Here's a recent clip from Elder Oaks who reminded us about the separateness of the members of the Godhead. We join other Christians in this belief in a Father and a Son and a Holy Ghost but what we believe about them is different from the beliefs of others. We do not believe in what the Christian world calls the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. We do not believe in what the Christian world calls the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. In contrast to the belief that God is an incomprehensible and unknowable mystery, we believe that the truth about the nature of God and our relationship to Him is knowable and is the key to everything else in our doctrine. And is the key to everything else in our doctrine. These personages are called God the First, the Creator, God the Second, the Redeemer, and God the Third, the Witness or Testator. It is the province of the Father to preside as the chief or president, Jesus as the mediator, and the Holy Ghost as the testator or witness." End of quote. I testify that we believe in God the Eternal Father and in His Son Jesus Christ and in the Holy Ghost. They are one Godhead, three separate beings or individuals. Here's truth number four, consolidated from verses 7 through 10. Jesus was, in the beginning, the Word, the light, and the Redeemer of the world. The worlds were made by Him, men were made by Him, and all things were made by Him. Jesus Christ is the Creator. So when we look outside and we see the wonders and the beauties of the earth in this universe, we need to praise Jesus Christ. Can you see now why verse 19 said, you really have to understand who Jesus Christ is. He's light and he's separate from the Father and he's the Creator so that we know who we are worshiping, so that we can understand how we should worship. Here's a fifth truth. Remember the song, Jesus once was a little child, a little child like me? I, John, saw that he received not of the fullness at first, but received grace for grace, but continued from grace to grace until he received the fullness. I think part of understanding that about the Savior is that even that the Savior grew grace for grace and grace to grace is that we should not defeat and beat ourselves up when we have not yet achieved perfection. We're like the Savior, growing line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, making improvements. I was in Miami this past Sunday, and I attended a state conference, and as the state president was summarizing the state conference, he called upon all of the young adults in the, in the state to, to think about something. He invited them to not beat themselves up. He used this as an example. He said, you would never say to a friend some of the negative things that you say to and about yourself. If you wouldn't say those things to a friend, why are you saying them to yourself? I think that applies to this teaching. Jesus grew grace for grace. So are we. I think that will help us understand who we are worshiping in the Savior and why he loves us and is so patient with us.
Another truth, truth number six. And it shall come to pass that if you are faithful, you shall receive the fullness of the record of John the Baptist. Uh, if you want to read more about this, the Institute Manual teaches more about this. But I love the idea that if we are faithful, there are more revelations which have been given, which God will then give to us. So hang in there. Be true. If you want to understand what we're worshiping and how we're worshiping, you need more revelation. So you better be faithful to what you have so that I can give you more. Here's another truth. I give unto you these sayings that you may understand and know how to worship and what you worship, that you may come unto the Father in my name and in due time receive of his fullness. Truth number seven is the fullness is coming in due time. So as we worship the Savior who is light, as we worship the Savior who is separate from his Father, as we worship the Savior who is the creator of all things, as we obey his commandments, and as we receive ourselves little by little to become like the Savior, grace for grace, that the fullness of the Father is coming in due time. Now, I'm going to switch gears because I think the last part can be rolled into three words. Why do we want to know what we're worshiping and how to worship the Savior Jesus Christ? Because he's promising glory and truth and a fullness of joy. And you'll notice the references here. But he is promising us all glory. Here's the phrase. Be glorified in me. I love that. The glory isn't mine. The glory is that of the Savior, Jesus Christ. So the closer I become like him and the closer I stand to him, the more of his glory shines across me and reflects through me that I can become like him. But the glory is his. I'm never going to usurp or take glory from God or his Savior, Jesus Christ. We are glorified in him and through him, and by him. And that's the invitation. But the glory is coming as we stand closer to him. Truth. Truth is Christ. Christ is truth. Truth is the knowledge of things as they are, as they were, and as they are to come. So a fullness of an understanding of the plan of salvation is required in order to understand truth. We've got to understand, for example, the truth about the premortal world to know we are children of God, to know that there was a plan presented, to know that we knew that we would face adversity in this life. We have to know the purpose of this life. The purpose of this life is to love God and love our neighbor and keep God's commandments along the way, to make covenants with him so that he can bless us and lift us and edify us, grace for grace to become like him, and to know that there is an afterlife. We will live again. And we can live again with family and with God if we choose that path. We've got to know the truth of things as they were, as they are, and as they are to come. When it comes to truth, I think of a staircase. No man receiveth the fullness of truth unless he keepeth his commandments. So we climb up a step and we keep the commandments that were given. And God gives us more truth and hence more commandments. So we climb another step and God gives us more truth and we understand more. And once we understand to that level, we climb another step and we get more truth and more commandments, more truth and more commandments. Obedience to commandments brings more truth and more commandments bring more truth and so on and so on and so on. That's the pattern of the Lord. He's not going to give us more unless we're willing to keep and live what we have already received. Have you ever wondered why there's so much about commandments and obedience, obedience, commandments, commandments, commandments? Well, here's the answer. The glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. Light and truth forsaketh that evil one. Those are verses 36 and 37. The glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. Light and truth forsaketh the evil one. It is one thing to know something, and it's another thing entirely to live what you know. For example, a person might know that doing drugs impairs their ability to think clearly, and yet they still might do drugs. That's not intelligence. It's knowledge, they know it, but intelligence is living up to what you know, because intelligence truly is the proper application of knowledge. We have to live what we know. 
that's intelligence. And the glory of God then is obedience to light and truth. The glory of God is intelligence. It's obedience to light and truth. No wonder the Old Testament teaches us that obedience is the first law of heaven because obedience is the application of knowledge. I love 37, how that fits in. Light and truth forsaketh the evil one. When we gain more light and truth and live up to that light and truth, we have more power to resist temptation. But when we shut out light, the Savior is light. When we shut out the Savior from our lives, Satan has more and more power in our life. I think one simple application is this. Keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. In this, there is safety and peace. That's truly true. All right. We know that in Latter-day Saint theology, that inside of every person that's alive, there's a spirit. Here's one artist's rendition of that exemplifying that our body is a gift from God. When we die, the spirit is buried or cremated or placed in the earth somewhere, and the spirit continues to live. Section 93 makes it clear that only when we are resurrected and we have an already perfect spirit reunited with a now perfected body without flaws and without imperfections that there is a fullness of joy. Only when the body and the spirit are inseparably connected, that happens at resurrection, can we receive a fullness of joy. That's the grand eternal truth. That's the grand truth. We will have times of joy and happiness in this life. I just went with my wife and a daughter and we did ceilings this morning in the Rexburg Temple and there was great joy. And then we left the temple and we came back and there are struggles and trials and challenges but the eternal joy will come when we're resurrected. What a glorious thing to look forward to. Then the verse, the invitation from the Lord to be more diligent and concerned at home. Elder Bednar gave a talk about being more diligent and concerned at home. I love that talk. I'll play an excerpt from it here. We can begin to become more diligent and concerned at home by telling the people we love that we love them. Such expressions do not need to be flowery or lengthy. We simply should sincerely and frequently express love. We also can become more diligent and concerned at home by bearing testimony to those whom we love about the things we know to be true by the witness of the Holy Ghost. Now let me add to Elder Bednar's testimony, the testimony of President Packer, who said, you know what? Parents cannot be judged on how their kids turn out. Listen to why. The measure of our success, however, as parents will not rest solely on how our children turn out. That judgment would be just only if we could raise our families in a perfectly moral environment, and that now is not possible. It is not uncommon for responsible parents to lose one of their children for a time to influences over which they have no control. They agonize over rebellious sons and daughters. They're puzzled over why they are so helpless when they've tried so hard to do what they should do. It is my conviction that those wicked influences one day will be overruled. Yeah, I love that thought that if we were raising our kids in a morally clean environment, then we would be accountable for how our kids turn out. But we live in a fallen world. And I love his testimony that one day the influences of the fallen world will be overruled and our children will have a choice to choose God. I love that that choice will come to them. Let me conclude with a wonderful little story that took place a number of years ago. The church has made a video out of it, and I want to tie these truths together. How studying Christ and studying the gospel and looking to the Savior brought peace to this one young man. I testify that joy can come in this life and permanently in the next. I testify that as we obey what we know, God will bless us with greater strength to overcome sin and temptation.
It was my birthday, and I was playing in a JV basketball tournament in Tabor. And the whole time that we were playing, anytime there was a timeout or there was a quiet part of the game, uh, Beans would always yell out, Happy birthday, Darren! He probably said happy birthday to me 25 times in that game. Beans always made me feel good. There's nothing about Beans that ever made me feel bad about myself or mad or, or sad. Chris, actually, he was named Beans through his friends at school. I always called him Chris myself. Beans, uh, he was one of those guys that uh, everyone loved. He would find people who weren't in this group of friends and weren't necessarily in any group of friends, and he would go and he would befriend them. Chris was the most selfless person I've like ever met. That morning, I went over with my seminary teacher, Brother Scott, to the Yokoyama's house. And I saw Beans' parents, and I went up to them and I I said sorry. That That's all I could say was sorry. I, I didn't know what else to say. For Darren, it, was, it wasn't physical. It was the anguish of losing a friend and knowing that another friend was hurt that really hurt Darren. I continue to wonder and ponder what happened and, and actually wonder if Heavenly Father knew who I was and if he was actually there. It didn't make sense to me how I was the driver and Beans had passed away and Chris was in critical condition in Calgary. And I walked home that night. I was lost, I was confused, I was mad, I was, I was angry, I was all these feelings. And I, I wanted answers now, I didn't, I didn't want to wait. And Heavenly Father doesn't work that way, I've learned. Um, he does it in different ways. The next Monday, there was well over 250 kids that came through the door of the seminary. It was hard to watch kids struggle and cry, but it was comforting to see them turn to the Lord for that comfort rather than just seeking out friends. And there was a whole bunch of people there and not one person to me ever said, it's your fault or anything like that. I could feel, I could feel the love. I could feel the spirit. And I knew Beans was okay at that time. And that he didn't want us to be upset, that he was happy and he wanted us to carry on and be missionaries here on earth. At that time, I also learned that Heavenly Father knows who I am knows who each of us are and that he uh, he knows that um, if we have faith that we can conquer anything and that he doesn't give us a trial that we can't overcome. Ask God for help. Um, he will give you help. Over the past year and a half, it's been tough, but being on my knees quite a bit, I got answers later on plan of salvation, the atonement, it's real to me. Before, I mean, you, you learn it in seminary, you learn it in church your whole life when you're growing up, but until you actually apply it to your life, it takes a whole different meaning. From that, I know that Beans is all right, and that uh, I'll get to see him again.